Hello and welcome back. This is day two of section 22 notes. If you're on your note packet, it's on the back of page four. And we're going to start actually creating a frequency distribution. And remember, I talked about finding the class width and class boundaries today in class to give you an idea. There's going to be some important um, formulas at the end that you can just put on your vocabulary sheet. So let's look. Here's a whole bunch of data about temperature in the 50 states. And they say construct a grouped frequency distribution for the data using seven classes. They actually tell you how many classes there are. And they chose seven arbitrarily, because that's up to the researcher or the person doing the presentation as to how many classes that you have. So. If we take this data, we're going to determine the classes. And they already told us that we um, have seven. So you take the highest and the lowest value, and then you subtract them. So you've got 134 and 100. Those are the high and the low. You subtract them to find the range. So you're going to have 134 minus 100. And then you're going to divide by the number of classes. So seven, as I said, that's up to the researcher to determine what, how many classes there are. It's range by the number of classes and then rounding up. So we did 34 over 7 and we got 4.9 and you round up. You never round to the nearest. Round to the nearest you could go up or down. But rounding up is going up to the next whole number. So you always go up to the no, next whole number. If this had been 4.02, you would have gone up to 5, the next whole number. All right, so let's look at the starting point for the lowest class. That's, that's where we go. So the starting point is 100, and then we go up by 5s because that's the width of our class. So you go 100, 105, 110, 115, 120, 125, 130. Sounds like I'm at an auction, doesn't it? These are all the lower limits of each class. And then you do the class 9, and third class is 110 to 114. You subtract one unit from the lower limit of the second class to get the upper limit of the first class. What they mean by that is instead of going to 100 to 105, they went 100 to 104. It's one less. 104 was one less than the 105. Find the class boundaries by subtracting 0.5 from the lower class limit and adding 0.5 to the upper class limit. Because these are whole numbers, you go down half a step, and half a step is 0.5. So the class boundaries for the first class, remember the first class was 100 to 104. You go down one half step, so it's 99.5 to 104.5. 104.5 to 109.5, 109.5 to 114.5. Because you'd be going down 105, down one is 104. If you notice, the high, the upper limit for one class boundary is the lower limit for the next one. You see how the 104 is repeated, 104.5 is repeated, 109.5 is repeated, and so on. That'll help you with your chart. So then you're tallying the data, which we know how to do, put the little hash marks, finding the numerical frequencies, that's counting up the tallies, and then find the cumulative frequencies. This is a new word, and all it is is you add the frequency of each class to the sum of the frequencies preceding that class. I'll show you how that works with this chart. So here's our class limits. 100 to 104, and then we go up 1, 105 to 109, and then we go up 110. And some people, um, when they make this chart, like you find the lower limits for all of those was 100, 105, 110. They actually go ahead and fill out 100, 105, 110, 115, and so on down this column. And then put the lower limits by going up by 4. So next one's 115 to 119, 120 to 124, 125 to 129, 130 to 134. And then get in the boundaries. Like I said, see how this went from 99.5 to 104.5? You start the next one with 104.5, then go to 109.5. It's five more. And then you can do that each time. And so you get the rest of them. So 109.5, then this repeats, the 19 that repeats, and so on. So if you get one of them, you can usually keep going and get the rest of them. The tally. Pretend like we went through and tallied all the data. This is what we'd end up with if we tally all of those. And the frequency is just from your tally marks. Now, what is nice is this was a lot of data to tally up. And if we spent the time 
tallying. It did take a little bit. But you have technology now in the form of Excel and some other different types of programs that you can put the data in and count if it's in a certain range in that. And we're going to do a project like that in class with Excel where we actually let the, let the computer do the work for us. Now, frequency, you're going to have this 2818 and the rest of them fill in those in. Cumulative frequency, this sounds complicated, but it's very simple. The first one starts out as just two, okay? Now we add those up. This little summation sign means adding all those up. We've got 50. It's a good double check to make sure that you've tallied all the data. Okay, cumulative frequency, back to that, two, because in the first class there was two. What you do to get the cumulative is you're going to take that two plus eight, so you add those two together. So 2 plus 8 is 10, and that's the cumulative frequency. So you're adding as you go down. This is how many um, data, point, data values have been accumulated so far is 10. So you take the 10 plus the 18 to get the 28, and so on. So 28 plus 13 is 41. 41 plus 7 is 48. Then you've got the 49, and you've got the 50. These two should match up. If they don't match up, something's wacky on your um, addition or something like that. So now you've got the cumulative frequency. So there it is. Why are they used? To show how many data values are accumulated up to and including a specific class. Also shows you how most of the data, does it fall early on or later on? So if you only have a few, you know, it doesn't accumulate very fast and then it accumulates greatly at the end, it also shows you the distribution of your data. In the previous example, how many of the total record high temperatures are less than or equal to 114? If you look at the cumulative data, it's very easy. So you look there, it's 28, because at that time, 28 had accumulated, if you look at your chart. And you can look at your cumulative data column to answer that question. And then how many record high temperatures are less than or equal to 124? That's 48. So that's a lot. So there you have most of the states don't get above 124. I was in Spain one time. Holy cannoli. It was, uh, I believe it was 38 or 39 degrees Celsius, which was like over 100 degrees. It was crazy hot. Okay. After the raw data has been, has been organized, have been organized. I can't get over that. Data is plural, but it sounds weird to me. Into a frequency, it will be analyzed to find the peaks and extreme values. All right, what do the peaks show? It shows which classes have the most data values that peaks at high. Just like when we were looking at our test values, where it peaked was how, you know, most people got a B or most people got an A or, you know, well, most people got Bs and Ds instead of As and Cs. What do extreme values show? That shows large or small data values relative to the other data values. So if all your data is grouped in the 60s and you have one that is 5, that's an extreme value. It's very small compared to the rest of the data. Or if all your data falls in the 60s range and you have like a, a value of 500, that's extremely large compared to that range. So another word for an extreme value is an outlier. Outlier. All right, when should an ungrouped frequency distribution be used? That's if you have a range that's very small. And the example they give is, um, the example they give is miles per gallon for SUVs. And in each data class, there's just going to be one value. So in this case, here was our data. And they have, these are the miles per gallon for all these SUVs, sports utility vehicles obtained in city driving construct frequency distribution, and analyze the distribution. So on this guy, we're first going to determine the classes. The classes are small. So 19, that's our high value, minus 12, our low value, we got 7. And here's the classes. Since there's only one data value in each class, it's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, because those are all the possibilities. Note, if the data are continuous, class boundaries can be used. You subtract 0.5 from each class value to get the lower class boundary and so on, which we've done a couple of times. Tally it up and find the numerical frequency. So here we go. Here's our class limits. All those are going to go up by 1, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, 17, 18, and 19. Those are our class limits. Class boundaries, remember, you go down by a half a step and up by a half a step. So these are going to be 11.5 to 12.5. 12.5 12 
12.5 to 13.5, 13.5 to 14.5, and so on. Now, a way to check that you have done this right, the widths all have to be the same. So the class widths, if I take 13 minus 12, I get 1. That needs to be the same as when I subtract the class boundaries. If I subtract 12 minus 5 minus 11.5, that needs to be 1. And so you can kind of check that you set that up correctly if the class widths are consistent. Tallying it up, let's pretend we did that. So here's what the tally marks look like. Again, you can have a computer program do this for you much faster. And then the frequencies are just the tally marks. So you got 7, 1, 3, 6, I'm sorry, 6, 1, 3, 6, 8, 2, 3, and 1. So those are the frequencies. Cumulative, remember you start out, the first one is just 6. Oh, I always forget. That's the total number down there, 30 of them. So we added them up, we know we got all our data points. So 6 is there, then you add the 6 plus the 1 to get the cumulative, which is 7. Then you add the 7 and the 3 to get 10. And then you keep going. 10 and 6 is 16. 16 plus 8 is 24, 24 and 2 is 26, 26 and 3 is 29, 29 and 1 is 30. Bada boom, bada bing, they match up, we're happy, happy, happy. So what are the peaks? You can look at that chart and see that they peak at 12, 15, and 16 miles per gallon. If we look, the peaks of the data, you look at the frequency. This was large compared to the next ones, and then it peaked here, 6 and 8. That's where the peaks are. And um, mine, actually, my, S, my little SUV, not little, my Buick, as some people say, gets 15 and a half. So it falls right into that peak. Most of them are right in there, which is actually pretty good for the size vehicle it is. Okay, so there's that. All right, what do we got next? Write the steps for constructing a grouped frequency distribution. That was different. The last one we did was ungrouped. Each class limit was one single data value. Grouped, you have to determine the classes, how many you're going to have. Sometimes it's arbitrarily chosen. Sometimes you have, you know, you split it a certain way. So you find, to determine the classes, you find the high and the low. Find the range by doing that. So find the highest and lowest value so you can subtract them to find the range. Select the number of classes you want. Find the width. So you take the range divided by the number of classes and then round up. Select the start point, lowest value, or convenient number less than lowest. Whenever you see this new number sign, that's just I, I write that instead of number. I hate writing. Find the upper class limits. Find the boundaries. So that's what you're doing to do step one. Then you tally them up to find the frequencies. Oops, sorry, too fast. So you tally up the data, you find the frequencies, and then you can find the cumulative frequencies. A lot of times you'll put percent on there, especially depending on which type of graph you're making to display. It's up to you. What are your five reasons for constructing a frequency distribution? The reason that we're doing this, this is the main thrust of this lesson. We're learning to make a frequency distribution because it's or it or can organize data in a meaningful intelligible way and you can look and find patterns to enable your reader to determine the nature or shape of distribution so you can see the peaks and the valleys to fa facilitate com computational procedures for average and spread that's going to be in a later chapter and to enable you to draw conclusions and charts and graphs so that you can present the data to people and make a convincing argument and last, to enable the reader to make comparisons among the different data sets. So that is the end of the notes for 2.2, but you also have some important formulas on your vocabulary sheet. They're on page 86, but I put them here for you just for convenience sake. To find the percentage of values in each class, like the ones we did in class and that, the percent, you take the frequency of the class divided by the total number of values times 100 but you'll get the decimal and you can change the decimal to a percent. The range is the high value minus the lowest value. Class width, they just do upper boundary minus lower boundary. Those are all the ones that end in 5.5 and so on. That's how you find class width. Class midpoint, this was earlier in your notes, but there's two ways to do it. And I would probably use the boundaries again just because you're using the boundaries for the class width. 
degrees per section of a pi graph. You might not remember this. You take the frequency over the total number and times 360 because it's this part of a whole circle and a whole circle is 360 degrees. That's it and I will see you tomorrow. Hope you have a nice evening.